Good day. I'm Edward Finn. I'm a retired professor from Georgetown University, physics professor at that, and also a co-author of a number of books. Uh, uh, they've been changed into a couple of languages here and there along the way, too. And my guest is again Dr. Rodney Brooks. Rodney, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm not a professor of physics. I have a, I have a PhD in physics. Uh, from Harvard University, and I have a book that I've written also. It's called Fields of Color, The Theory That Escaped Einstein, and I want to say that I wrote this book because the theory that I learned at Harvard from Julian Schwinger called quantum field theory has unfortunately escaped the public in general and much of the physics community, and I wanted to present it to people. Okay, thank you very much. What we are going to discuss today is exactly what is a field. A field is a property of space. Now that's quite simple, there's no question about it, but you have to recognize that it took centuries for the physics community to actually be comfortable with the concept. That's right. Even for the physics community to accept the idea, to come up with and accept the idea of a field, and I want to put in also that as a student, I, and I suspect you, also struggled for quite a while with that concept. And what, what I'm going to tell you is the very simple basics of what a field is and use gravity and the electric magnetic field as the concepts. An amazing thing, Newton, who started to revolutionize physics by constructing the first theory that explained quantitatively what was happening on Earth and in the heavens, recognized that there was something missing, and he wrote as follows, that one body may act upon another at a distance without the mediation of anything else is to me so great an absurdity that I believe no man who has a, in philosophical matters a competent faculty of thinking can ever fall into it. Newton wrote that in 1684, and yet for two centuries, competent physicists, supposedly competent, continued to believe in action at a distance. But I'd like to read you another quote that sounds slightly different from the one you just heard from Isaac, and it reads as follows. We may then say that the mass M produces, in the space around it, a physical situation that we call a gravitational field. This field is recognized by the force that this mass M exerts on another smaller mass brought into that region. Well, that tells us what a field is beautifully. Who wrote that, Ed? Well, it's from my book, but, but it's ah. just, just a small piece from, from my book. Um, in my book, Fields of Color, and the reason it's called Fields of Color, Thank you. is that I use a color analogy. Saying a field is a property of space is very abstract. If you can picture a space having colors, and if we can assign a color to each field, then it helps you. Of course, I'm not saying the space is colored, but I'm saying this mental image can help you imagine space with properties. So I arbitrarily use the color blue for the magnetic field. For the... Excuse me, thank you. For, for the, the gravitational, gravitational field. field for the, I use the color blue. And if you can picture the Earth, with a blueness in the space around it, going out in all directions, tapering off gradually, but never going to zero, then you have a kind of feeling of what the gravitational field of the Earth is like. 200 years later, Michael Faraday is fooling around in his laboratory because electricity and magnetism have become of interest to everyone. And there was a gentleman by the name of Hans Christian Ersted who had done a an experiment in 1820, and in this experiment he discovered that when a wire is carrying an electric current, there is magnetism, that was the way they described it then, magnetism around the wire. And if you turn off the electricity, the magnetism disappears. Now this is pretty wild. Michael had an interesting intuition. And he was actually the first 
physicist, the first person to come out with this concept that there is indeed something there in space, some properties of space. And if you go to London and visit the Faraday Museum, as I happen to have done, you can see his laboratory notebook on display there. And he used a magic word. He used the for the first time in 1845, he wrote the word field in That's his notebook. Correct. So he is truly the father of the concept of fields in physics. And however, he didn't, Faraday as it happens, was not very mathematical at all. And I think you'll tell us about the next step made by somebody who came up with the equations. Well, that fellow, uh, his name was, I have to be careful because I'm not very English. His name is James Clark there you go. Maxwell. And about 20, 30 years later, he was the one who wrote what are called Maxwell's equations. And if you are ever see a physics student, he's probably got a t-shirt on with these equations written on them. It's one of the fancy ways that they do this thing. I, right? I've seen them. Yeah. Oh yeah, we've all seen them. But let me tell you how a certain fellow who is going to come up a little later too, his name is Alfred Einstein, said something about the magnetic field. He said, we have come to regard action at a distance as impossible without go. some intermediary medium. We are constrained to imagine, after the manner of Faraday, that the magnet calls into being something physically real in the space around it, and that something being what we call a magnetic field. Um, so now we have, for the first time in physics, the concept of an electromagnetic field and also the equations that describe, thanks to Maxwell, that describe how that field propagates through space. By the way, uh, that field, the electromagnetic field, includes everything from light to radio to television waves and on up, uh, quite a spectrum. Absolutely. But I've assigned the color green in my book arbitrarily to help you picture that there is electromagnetic fields in space. And to take two examples, let's take a nucleus, a charge, a positively charged nucleus. Uh, that, those pos those uh, protons, a positive charge, set up an electric field around it, which you might picture as a greenness of the space extending out. And going back to the Earth, which we know has a blue, arbitrary, uh, arbitrarily chosen magnetic, uh, uh, gravitational field, superimposed on that, picture a kind of green halo around the Earth, which is representing the magnetic field of the Earth. But it was in 1915 that that fellow that I read the quote about, in 1915, it was Albert Einstein who wrote the mathematical equations that describe the time-dependent gravitational field. So here we are. We now have two fields that we have described, which you probably knew about already, but never thought of them in this exact way. One, the Earth's gravitational field, or the gravitational field, and then the electromagnetic field, not electric and magnetic, but electromagnetic field. Our current understanding of nature is not just that it's made of fields, but a special kind of field called quantum fields. The concept of the quantum was introduced, interestingly enough, in the year 1900. So that we have a beautiful division between classical physics and the quantum revolution. And it was introduced by another great genius, Max Planck, a German physicist, who was studying radiation from uh, hot bodies, for example, a heating element in a, or a light bulb, and he found the most amazing surprise. Nobody could explain the shape of the, the properties of this radiation, but if you assume that it was emitted in chunks, you could explain it. And he himself said to his son on that day, today I have made a discovery of as important as that of Newton, and it was. Here was something entirely new, which seemed called upon to basically revise all our physical thinking. 
he recognized this and he was certainly right because from then on physics was never the same. So the essence of quantization, what is a quantum field? How does it differ from a classical field? It's made up of chunks, indivisible units, not particles, not localized particles, but spread out fields. But one chunk here, one chunk there, one chunk there. In my book, I use a sugar analogy. I say, suppose you're taking sugar from two bowls. One bowl has granulated sugar. And you can take any amount you want, as little or as much as fine. You can take any amount. One grain, anyway. Yeah. Down to one grain. Well, yeah. okay. make, believe, I know. I know. Uh, make yeah. believe it's very finely granulated. Yes. There you go. But the other bowl contains cubes. And all you can take is one cube, or two cubes, or three cubes. That's a kind of analogy for what a quantized field is. Each quantum of field that's been emitted uh, somehow superimposes on others, but it lives and dies a life yeah, of its own. So Planck then had introduced this concept, and from that point on fields, the electromagnetic field, um, and the other fields I'm about to describe, all have this quantum property to them. Let me mention to you the, uh, the remaining fields in physics. The next two are called nuclear fields. They exist in the nucleus. They're called the strong field and the weak field. The strong field is what holds the nucleus together. This was discovered by a Japanese physicist, physicist named Hideki Yukawa. Quite a story there. And uh, I would like to read just one quote from uh, Yukawa that indicates what he did. Nobody in European physics community had been able to understand what holds the nucleus together until he came along. Interactions between the nuclear particles can be described by means of a field of force, just as the interaction between the charged particles is described by the electromagnetic field. So using the analogy of the electromagnetic field, but modifying it by introducing a mass term into the field equations, Yukawa came up with a successful theory of the strong force. Ano now talk about the weak field. An I was just going to. Another force that exists within the nucleus is called the weak field. I won't go into that at all. It's a, a complex subject, but the story is fascinating. It began in the 1800s when a French physicist couldn't wait for the sun to shine. And if you want to read more about that story, please take a look at my book. But I want to tell you especially about the two matter fields, because that's matter the field. biggest bone to chew on in understanding what is a quantum field, because the essence of a quantum field is the realization that the electron and the proton and the neutron are not particles, as people think, as most people think, and as we have even been talking about them, but they're fields. Rutherford had come up with a concept of the atom, I think he did it in 1911, with a concept of the atom as made of a nucleus made out of protons and neutrons and electrons, little balls going around in circles around them. Of course. But what is an electron? The electron is a field. And in quantum field theory, if you'll picture the nucleus as a blob of redness, using my color analogy, surrounded by a yellowness in the space around it, not by little balls going around in circles, but by a yellowness of the space around it, that's what the electron looks like. The electron is a field using yellow as a way to visualize it. In quantum field theory, there are these six fields. The, okay. ones, the ones we've discussed, gravity, electromagnetism, the two nuclear fields, the two matter fields. They're all quantum fields. Okay, okay. We, but we haven't found the graviton yet, right? Okay. The quantum we field of nature, right, the quantum field nature of the gravitational field has not been experimentally demonstrated. But that's to be expected given the large scale in which it works. That doesn't mean it's not a quantum field. Yeah. Can you okay. accept that? It's kind of, I'm kind of pretending toward the quantum field for the gravitational field simply because why in the world would, oh, excuse me, why would God leave it out? If he'd make exactly. all these other ones quantum fields, then he's got to do it too. I'd like to tell you that these six fields that I've talked about and the quantum field nature of them and the equations that were developed have led to great successes that have created 
a, a triumph, you might say, for quantum field theory. It's explained so many things. It's resolved the paradoxes of quantum mechanics. It's explained the Higgs mechanism, which is very much, and I'd like to mention also, it's produced what a Nobel laureate physicist, Frank Wilczek, called one of the greatest scientific achievements of all time. And yet, people don't know about this. People don't know about one of the greatest scientific achievements of all time. The sad truth is that quantum field theory is mostly neglected, even within the physics community. But I do want to say that things may, the tide may be turning. I hope that my book will reach people, but other physicists also, to name a few, Art Hobson, who published an article called There Are No Particles, There Are Only Fields, Sean, Sean Carroll and Frank Wilczek, especially his book, The Lightness of Being. So things are beginning to change and come around for the better.